Friday. Yay, Friday again. Uh, you're a little crooked over there. Let me just uh, let me just straighten you up just a tad. There we go. That's a little bit better. All righty. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me. I have got my microphone definitely on. Yep. Always double check just after I turn on the camera. That just seems to be how I do things around here. Um, so I've got a few things to look at today and we'll get straight to the big one. Uh, this is the thing with now doing the YouTube videos is that I get less time chatting and messing around and more time actually talking about the topic for the day. Uh, and today's topic is this. This is five parsecs from home. This is the, well, this is this really interesting. Um, so hopefully you've heard of five parsecs from home before, but if you haven't, let me give you a little bit of a history. So. Um, Five Parsecs from Home is the sci-fi version of a range of games that are all 5x from Y. Um, you know, there might be uh, five clicks from the zone, I think, is one of the others. And there's a fantasy version that's probably five leagues from safety or something like that. Anyway, uh, these games have been written by Even Sorensen of uh, Nordic Weasel. Now, I, I vaguely have an idea that Even hasn't written on his own, but I've had contact with Even, so I know that he's the, the guy behind this one. Um, and it, it, I, I, I should own up to a certain amount of personal contact with Ivan. I have a, a very uh, positive feelings towards Ivan because every time I publish a game, uh, he sends me an email to congratulate me, which is incredibly sweet of him and, and amazingly sort of conscientious because I'll be honest I tend not to notice when other people are playing games I uh, are publishing games um, I wish I had time in my brain space to notice that that stuff is happening without people having to tell me uh, so the fact that Ivan is is so aware of what I'm doing and I'm paying so little attention to what he's doing is both flattering and and ever so slightly embarrassing which is one of the reasons we come to here so I say that up front to say I am predisposed to like this game on the basis that I like Ivan very much, despite never having met him face to face. I can just tell he's going to be uh, one of those immensely pleasant people that we seem to have so many of in this industry. So that's really cool. Um, and, and the game itself desires, requires some, some talking over. So Five Parsecs from Home has been around for a while. I couldn't tell you exactly how long, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's five, six, maybe longer than that in terms of years. Um, it's been around a while, um, and it had already gone through two editions with Nordic Weasel. Nordic Weasel, you may or may not have heard of. They're predominantly a an online publisher. They publish through Wargame Vault, just like Precinct Omega, um, but they've been doing it for much longer than me, and and have have gained a very loyal and enthusiastic following, and and they've learned a lot about how to do it well, stuff which I'm, I'm still learning from. Um, but this is the third edition of the rules, and most interesting about this is that, uh, oh, I've just had a quick note. Peter Bickerton is in the chat. He says it's five leagues from the Borderlands. Oh, that was a good guess. I thought it was gonna be five leagues from something. So five leagues from the Borderlands is the fantasy version of this game. So uh, this is the third edition. It is a new edition. It's not just a reprint of the second edition. There is additional material. But if you've played either the first or the second edition, the contents of this book are all going to be very familiar. Um, the, this version has been printed by Modifius Entertainment. Uh, I say printed by, a lot of this is courtesy of Modifius Entertainment. Um, in terms of production values and presentation, this book is a parsec further on than the second and first editions of the book. This is a good looking piece of publication. Um, and I, I asked Ivan when, uh, when this was sort of first out, I said, so did you approach Modifius or did they approach you? And he said to me, oh, Modifius approached me. And I thought that was super interesting. Uh, his, his belief is that, you know, Modifius is producing an increasing diversity and range of games, but this kind of adventure game idea, where it's not a 
miniatures war game as most people will think about it in the bolt action Warhammer Age of Sigmar mold. Um, but it's more of a tabletop experience that people participate in to tell a narrative story. So if you look at Modifius's other games, um, like their Fallout game, like their Elder Scrolls A Call to Arms game, um, like um, Achtung Cthulhu, there, there's a lot, and there's a 2D20 Achtung Cthulhu, which is a roleplay game as well, but there's a lot more emphasis on the use of miniatures and the tabletop as a storytelling tool than there is on you know the the hard pvp competitive context that perhaps is more familiar to us as wargamers and, and I, i'm fascinated by this idea i think it's a terrific idea i think there's a lot of strength to it one of the things i love about it is that i think it's going to make the game more accessible to people who may find the competitive aspect of tabletop wargaming off-putting. Um, and I don't just mean, mean the competitive aspect of you versus me, we roll dice and we get a winner, um, but also that competitive side of everybody's got, you know, there's this who knows the rules better, who's got more of the books, who has a denser grasp of the game, who has the better painted army, who's got the latest stuff. You know, there's this, this competitive... Um, temperament to tabletop wargaming that people coming in as new starters it's like starting a race at the starting line when everybody else is 400 meters further down the route and and i think games like five parsecs and the other modifius games are a, a much more attractive way for people who are interested in miniatures gaming to come into the hobby without feeling that that level of competitiveness to kind of discourage them, to, to undermine their enthusiasm. Yeah. So philosophically, you know, I like the people behind this game very much. I don't know the guys at Modifius. I'd love to. Um, maybe they'll come on interview on the podcast sometime. I, but I like the fact that they've seen this game and they thought it had a place in their stable of products. So that's you know, by way of a, a lengthy introduction. Now let's get to the book itself. So first of all, this is a little book, you know, for a, for a wargamey book. This is like teeny weeny. Let me uh, uh, show you just by way of example. Uh, okay, so that, that's the infinite dark. It's like smaller than that. Uh, interesting, I, I've only just noticed that they're, they're almost the same height. It's only a little bit taller, but it's, it's much narrower. Uh, if I show you, not that one, put that one away. Uh, last week's game, there we go. That was, this is much more sort of conventional game book size. Uh, it's a lot smaller than that. So that was the first thing that struck me as I got it out of the packaging was, oh, this is a, this is a teeny weeny book. That's, that's really interesting. Um, I don't know why they felt moved to make it so small. Uh, I don't know whether it fits in with the size of the other books. Certainly doesn't fit in with the size of the Infinity roleplay game. I own that, and it's it's a lot bigger than this. So uh, interesting, interesting. Not no you know no judgment, just interesting. Okay, then let's have a look at, at what we've got on this front cover. Um, so we've got a piece of art. It's sci-fi. It's combat. We've got a gun that's firing some kind of electrical power beam, got a spaceship in the background with somebody with a jetpack flying past. All of that is conveying, you know, that kind of ballistic, fast action combat with a, a I would say, a, a not that hard sci-fi feel. I am definitely getting post-cyberpunk space opera type vibes off this front cover. Um, nice choice of text on the front, matching up at the bottom, on the back, well laid out, much better than work than I've done on the reverse layout. Um, yeah, it's it's a, a good looking offering. You could genuinely pull this off the bookshelf thinking that what you're first looking at here is a novel. 
that could be your first impression if you found this in a bookshop you'd see that at the back and go oh five parsecs from home that sounds sounds like a good book um no author's name on the front cover but we get that on the inside so the art continues on the inside and we see this artist throughout the game the artist is credited uh it is christian quino and th there's examples of his art throughout which is great uh, we do have lead designer and writer up here, even Sorensen, so he does get that much credit. And then we've got a nice long list of names. Now, I found this list of names, um, just, I mean, I just found this alone fascinating to read. Um, not that many names up here that are familiar to me. Um, a few things that I would pull out from here... Um, who was I going to mention? I was going to mention Tom Hutchings, who did the layout, and Mark Whittington, the graphic designer. These guys have done good work. This is, this is one of the best laid out books of this kind that I have seen for a long time. Um, this is top quality stuff. Uh, the other people, you know, I, I don't know how much involvement they actually have in the creation of this book. I mean, did, did we need a data analyst credit in the front of the book? I mean, no... no um, don't wish to put Ben Greybeaton down in any way at all. I'm sure he's an outstanding individual. Um, but I, I, I'm curious that there's a name credit at the front of the book. But maybe that's a thing. Chris Birch is the guy, kind of, is the name behind Modiphius Entertainment. He's credited twice here as the project manager and as the chief creative officer at Modiphius Entertainment. Um, and I'm wondering this, if this is one of Chris's things, that he wants to make sure that the people who are involved in the business all get name credit, like, like credits at the end of a movie where everybody wants name credit in their contract. Um, and if that's what Chris is doing, uh, more strength to him. You know, people like this deserve more exposure in the industry for their, for their contributions. It's just, it just surprised me. That's all I'm saying. It was just, it was just surprising. Um, but uh, I like this because this is also a, like a list of people for me to track down and see if they want to come on the podcast because they've got all kinds of insights into different aspects of, of, of our industry uh, and it, they'd be interesting people to talk to. Obviously, Chris is at the top of my list um, and uh, hopefully Ivan, I, I've actually asked Ivan and he said he's interested. So uh, it would be good to have a, a chat with, with these folks and uh, find out more about their perspective. OK, that's enough of that. Let's move on. Table of contents, it's what you'd expect. It's a good, strong, coherent table of contents. Um, no index. No index. Which is a bit of a downer. This, this is a hefty book. They're, they're a little bit like last week's look at Polyversal. Um, there's a lot of rules here. Now, the rules aren't quite like Polyversal, and actually this is a far, far more accessible game. Um, very impressive in its accessibility. But there are a lot of rules, and I think an index is uh, an oversight that will frustrate people. But there is, the contents page is very comprehensive. So as long as you don't mind searching out what you're looking for in the contents page, it will probably sort you out for nine issues out of ten. But there's always that time when you're just remembering a particular rule and you don't know where to look. Would have been great to have an index. Doesn't have one. Uh, we've got a short introduction. And then we're straight into, I mean, this is sort of more of the introduction. It's about wargaming and about previous editions and acknowledgements and stuff. And then we're straight into the rules. And all of this is rules right up to page 136 when there is some setting. And we've got setting is like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we're at the end. And that's it. And then we're back to rules. So in all of these pages, there's like eight pages of setting. So I say the vast majority of this is is rules. Um, this is one of those games that I think most people who are into tabletop miniatures games could could play on the fly. You really could. Uh, so let, let's start with how you go. So you go through some conventions and, and the norms of the game, which is useful, but broadly you know, this is this is for the absolute beginner. I think most of us who've played miniatures games for any any length of time are going to be able to scan over this and go, yeah, 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 usual, whatever. Yep. Um, 
through the norms of the game, and then we're into character creation. And I love this. I love the character creations right at the start. And, and I always agonise over this for, for my games, and I agonised over it for Zero Dark to the extent that I would struggle to tell you with any certainty whether the team section comes before how to play the game in Zero Dark. That's how much I agonised over it and it went backwards and forwards and I can't remember which way around it comes. It doesn't matter. Uh, just a brief stop because I can see there's some more comments. Uh, Ralph, the colour, I think he's meaning to say the colour coded chapters helps with finding the rules to some extent but no excuse to not have an index. Yes. Totally agree. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, colour-coded. Yes, it is worth pointing out that all of these chapters do have their own colour, which is, I mean, it's, it's a nice design aspect, and you can see it on the edge of the pages, so you can see the different sections quite easily. I'd say that is great when you've got a contents reference and you want to flick through and find the right section. You can go, oh, I'm looking at the purple section. Where's the purple section? Oh, there it is. Great. It's probably purple. I'm colourblind, so... Whatevs. Right, um, so I love that they've put character creation first. I think that was exactly the right choice for this game because it means that players like me that are just ready to throw down can just pull some minis out of their cabinet, put them down on the table and go, right, how do I turn these guys into characters? And, and can get right on with it. Um, and also, that's right here. That is here as a method. And I, I also love that, that Ivan has considered multiple different time ways of how you might create your team in this game. Um, got a first timer, standard, random, which is bold, and the miniatures method. And my choice would absolutely be the miniatures method. Um, if I'm going to play this game, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the miniatures I want to use out on the table, and then everything else that follows is going to be how do I make these miniatures like the characters in here. If there's a random option, I'm not going to randomise it if, you know, if one of my miniatures has already got a great big heavy machine gun and there's a random choice for a heavy machine gun, guess what? He, he's, I'm not going to roll it. He's got a heavy machine gun. There's no way I'm giving that guy a laser pistol. It's not going to happen. Right. Okay, that, that's my approach. And I like, it's an option and it's thrown out there. So you've got all these randomising tables and this game has a lot in common with... Uh, Classic role-play games, things like um, nar narrative skirmish games like Inquisitor, um, going back to something like uh, Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader, the first edition of the game, loads of random tables. If you remember Realm of Chaos and all its random tables, lots of random tables in this game. And something which I would say, and which I think Ivan says explicitly in the rules, is look, the random tables are there to help you come to a decision if you're not sure or you want to just let the winds of fate guide you. If, on the other hand, you have a definite opinion on what result you want, just pick that result. It's that kind of game. Okay? You're not going to do yourself any harm. This isn't a game that you can min-max. Okay? So anyway, in this case, you know, you've got random crew types, uh, aliens, what are they called? Strange characters, and you can generate them, and then it goes on and explains what all of these things are. Now, one thing which I am interested by um, is he's got these, these are the sort of the strange character types. So, not strange character, sorry, these are the, uh, what are they called? Primary aliens. Primary aliens are these few. Um, the one, one teeny, teeny tiny layout issue I have with this is that that says engineers, and that's the engineer, and that says Ka'erin, and that's the Ka'erin. And... Um, I, I wouldn't have done it that way around. That's all I'm saying. I would have said I would have put the engineer there and the cat in there. Uh, it just seems more intuitive than that way. So I was genuinely confused over here. I, I assumed that was a cat and that was an engineer. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting design for an engineer with bones on his armour. Um, and then over here I was going, oh, Solus is that one and Precursor is that And I, I was confused. That's all I'm saying. Uh, obviously, it took me seconds to work it out, but in terms of natural layout, it's pretty much the only complaint I have about this, this book. Um, other interesting thing on this page, which isn't a complaint, it's just an, an observation. All art. So, description, art, description, art. There are no miniatures in this book at all. And 
my guess at why there are no miniatures in this book is that Modiphius did not want to be sued. That would be my guess. Um, whether if they put photos of miniatures from other manufacturers um, into this book that, that they might draw fire. Um, that seems strange to me because there are lots of manufacturers out there that would have loved to have been featured in this book. You know, immediately off the top of my head, you know, CP models, hassle-free miniatures, heresy miniatures, bad squiddo games. All of these guys are making minis, Curasan, fantastic miniatures that would have been perfect in this game. In fact, I've got a Curasan miniature that is a brilliant sci-fi mini, doesn't fit in Zero Dark. Will be great in this because it's a cat person, a felid. You know, you don't have cat people in Zero Dark because it's a hard sci-fi setting. But this, perfect. Um, I, and I feel like Modiphius easily could have reached out to those people for permission um, and, and got some high quality photography. You know, I, I talked last week about the photography in Polyversal and, uh, and Ken was, was so pleased with my comments about his being a strictly adequate painter that they are now on his Twitter bio, to my amusement. Um, but uh, the, the Modiphius could easily have put some fantastic painted miniatures into this book and there are none, which I think is a, an oversight. And this is a key opportunity that they could have matched up some of these designs with existing miniature designs and they didn't. I think that's, that's a, a waste of, wasted opportunity. Uh, then we've got the strange characters. They're all stuff. I mean, I could go through them one by one, but there's, there's no point. They're, they're things that you can choose. And you can pick them if you want, not if you don't. And talking about building your team, you know, there's a lot of density here. This is the difference between this rule book and Polyversal. There's a lot of density in the rules here, but you can ignore most of them. You know, you don't need to know the rules for all of these different races and robots and aliens. Yeah, you could just pick one of them and make your entire team out of that one type, or, or none of them. Everybody's a baseline human, you know, which is the most basic type of character there is in the game. Um, yes, it's very human-centric. Okay, so you don't need to know all that stuff. It's, it's fun, it's interesting, you can spend time reading and enjoying it, but hey, skip over it, and it won't make any difference to your ability to play the game. Okay, uh, there's, there's backgrounds, motivations, classes, all sorts of stuff. Uh, to give your characters more depth. Lots of random tables that you can roll on if you're inclined, but again, if you want to just not roll, don't roll. Just pick something that suits. Ship. Your team has a ship, and the ship is, is a significant part of the story. So, you know, your ship will come with a certain amount of equipment. One of the things you want to do is upgrade that. Your ship may take damage. Your ship may need refueling. There are all kinds of things that can, can be built into the storyline. If you've watched The Mandalorian, it's like the Razor Crest, yeah? So, but, but probably with a larger team than, than just Mando running around on his own with his uh, little goblin hobbit. Right, okay. <clears throat> flavor details. Um, it's it's flavour, you know, exactly. It's a good example. It, it's, it's detail that you could skip over. And then we get to the, the, the core rules. Okay, this is the bit at which the player is going to want to kind of slow down a bit and go, mm, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm here, now how do I play the game? And there's a lot good to say about these rules, but they are not, this is not a sophist, I was going to say it's not a sophisticated rule set, that's really unfair. This is not that innovative. There's nothing here that's going to make an experienced tabletop wargamer scratch their head and go, oh, that's a bit different. I've never seen it done like that before. That's, that's not going to happen. Um, that's not to say that, that these rules are derivative, but it's very much roll a dice, add a number, beat a target. And that's it. Um, so to give an example in combat, for the rules, so um, if you achieve a hit, you roll a dice, you add your weapons damage bonus to the dice, and if the result is higher than the target's toughness, the target is not only hit, but out, out of the game. 
it, it, it's quite unforgiving in that respect. Um, now, those modifiers are quite s slim. So you know, the toughness range is from, if I remember rightly, it's up to six. I think it's from like three to six is, is the range of toughness. And the damage bonuses that weapons have are between zero and three. And a lot of weapons have got a zero damage bonus and very few have got a three bonus. So, you know, there is an element of stacking up advantages to make your odds better. And, and it doesn't mean that the moment somebody's hit, they're, they're out of the game. But it does mean that the moment anybody is hit at all, they could be out of the game. Uh, if it's a six, it is on a d6, it is always a wound. You know, you're always gone. Um, so this is this is an unforgiving rule set, but the mechanics themselves are not. They're not going to set the world on fire. Yep. Uh, there are a few aspects of the mechanics that I slightly take issue with. So, for example, you can only use pistols and melee weapons in the brawl, which is what he calls CQB. Um, and I think anybody who has ever handled uh, a rifle. Um, is going to say that that's, that's unreasonable. Uh, a, a carbine, even a relatively short rifle, is a completely functional close combat weapon in many ways, um, and a deadly one. So I, I take a bit of an issue with that. Um, you know what I think about swords and melee weapons in close combat, but this is not a hard sci-fi setting, nor an ultra-modern setting. This is very much pulp sci-fi. Um, it is well suited to anybody who wants to skirmish game in the 41st millennium but finds Kill Team just too dull for words. Um, it is well suited to anybody who would like to play Infinity on a solo basis. Not much in the way of hacking, not no hacking, but not a lot in there. Um, but it, it, it would work if you wanted to play solo Infinity, put your Infinity minis down and turn them into... Uh, into characters, um, but it is definitely, um, it's Han Solo level wargaming, yeah? So you're not going to be bringing your ATST or your tags or your mechs, uh, that, not going to happen. Um, it's very close in feel to core space. Um, core space is a good deal more, yeah, it is a good deal more innovative than this game, but on the other hand, this is all I need to play this game, whereas to play Core Space, uh, I, I need a big box of stuff and to lay out card terrain all over the place with the gridded thing. This uh, great thing that Evan's done here is he, the rules assume that you're playing on a freeform tabletop like most tabletop miniatures games, but there is in the appendix some additional rules for playing it on a gridded surface. Uh, and they're really short. They're really short. And, and actually converting Zero Dark to a gridded surface is, has been quite challenging. Um, converting this to a gridded surface because the rules aren't all that out there um, actually is much easier and that kind of conversion is, is far easier in it and it shows it shows okay brief break to have a look at the comments somebody's telling me about the ships uh, so Peter Bickerton says the ship is a big change from the second edition it was just fluff text in there oh that's good that the ship has a big role to play in the third edition of the game, it is a cool thing. You don't need a ship miniature, but if you've got one, it's not going to hurt. I was very lucky to pick up a 28mm uh, shuttle miniature in MDF from Iliada Game Studios. Now, Ali only produced it very briefly as an experimental piece. Um, I managed to get hold of one, and it's awesome, and I'm absolutely going to use it in this game, because it's also got a playable interior as well as everything else. Uh, Mark Bjorkman, hello Mark. My Infinity Minis are already being well used in Zero Dark. Well, I should hope they are. Yes, they're very well suited as well to Zero Dark. Um, Stefan, Waves from Hospital, I hope you're feeling better, Stefan. Stefan has been on nil by mouth. Uh, I won't go into details, but he, he has been starving and miserable for the last couple of days. So send him love if you know him. Okay, um, let's move on. Let's move on. So that's just talking about the rules. The, all the kinds of rules you would expect are in here. Uh, there's a lot of detail, but a lot of that detail is, um, it's predictable stuff. You know, the cover rules, it's pretty much what you'd expect. Uh, lines of sight, exactly what you'd expect. One thing actually while we're passing on cover that I will mention that I really like in these rules, um, and actually I, I would absolutely say is 
an idea I am totally going to steal when Zero Dark is up for a second edition. Um, cover applies if you are within one inch of the cover. So in Zero Dark, I borrowed from Infinity, which requires you to be in contact with the cover. And something which I didn't think about when I was making that conversion was that in Infinity, it's sometimes really annoying that you have to be in contact with the cover because you'd like your miniature to be orientated in a particular direction. But because of the dynamic posing of the miniature, you can't orient them in that direction and have them in cover in contact with the cover because, you know, a sword or an elbow or something or a random piece of tactical rockage on the base is in the way. And you just kind of have to say to your opponent, look, 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 I did, they're facing this way, they're supposed to be in contact, they're not, but you can see that they're supposed to be. Yeah, 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 they say they understand. Right, which is great, and it all clears up. But this solution, in my opinion, is better. Within one inch of the cover is a great idea, because you're very unlikely to be in a position where you look at a character and go, is that character within one inch or not of that cover, where you're going to be on that borderline? Because if you're that close to the cover... As the player, you're going to be thinking, right, I need to make sure I'm definitely within one inch of that cover, so I benefit from that cover. And you only have to move a tiny bit, and you're definitely in cover, as opposed to trying to game it and be just, you know, exactly one inch away. Now, maybe in a competitive environment, you might get that gaminess, but my, my gut is that this is a better, more intelligent solution than the one that I and Infinity have used. Uh, and I like it, and I will almost certainly steal it when Zero Dark gets second edition. Okay, uh, that was it for cover. I wanted to talk about um, there's an action system, uh, but again, it's it's nothing that will surprise people. Um, a character can move and shoot with an action. Must be in that order. So you can choose to not move and then shoot, but if you choose to shoot, you can't then move afterwards. Okay. And there's a nice mechanic so that if you're stunned, your choice of move and shoot is reduced to move or shoot. And uh, another clever piece, again, perhaps not innovative, but clever. And that's, that's actually a, that's a really good summary of, of these rules. Not innovative, but clever. That I will stand on. Um, is that to clear stunning, uh, you just move or shoot. And once you move or shoot, the stunning is gone. And you can stack up up to three stun counters and each time you move or shoot, one of them is removed. So it just indicates that the, the character is that much slower, that much less capable than they were before they were stunned. Um, another clever feature is if you get four stun tokens, you're knocked out. Um, I don't have that in Infinity, uh, in Zero Dark rather. Uh, they just keep on, keep on stacking. Um, and, and when I read that rule in here, I thought, oh, could I have done something like that? Now, that's one of those occasions when I thought, no, I'm happy with where it is. But it's clever. I'll grant you, it is clever. Right. Uh, okay. This is interesting. Um, enemy movement. Now, actually, it's worth talking about this now. Um, so, Five Parsecs from Home is a solo game. So, there is an enemy force. And the enemy behaves in a way dictated upon the posture and type of enemy. And there are rules in here to, for all sorts of different types of enemy. So you, as part of setting up your mission, you decide possibly what kind of enemy you are facing. Or possibly it'll be dictated by a campaign or, as they call it, a, a story. Story line? It's not called a story line. I'll get to it eventually. It's called story something. Um, and these postures give you a list of rules for how those enemies behave. So and the postures here, just to give you an example, we've got cautious, aggressive, tactical, defensive, rampaging, and beast, and what's the last one? Guardian. Okay, are the different sort of postures. And I hope those sort of give you a sense of the different... Um, characters that an enemy can have. So, you know, a tactical enemy is a very different opponent to a beast enemy. And this isn't that dissimilar to the decision tree in um, Horizon War Zero Dark. But in this case, a lot more leeway is left to the player. You know, this is a pure solo game. 
And so it's assumed that the player is invested in making the enemy behave in a way that is narratively consistent. I said pure solo. Some people may take issue with that, and we will come to that later on in this review. But it does mean that you are left to judge precisely how that enemy behaves on the basis of the instructions you're given here. So there is quite a lot of leeway, um, and the assumption is that you're going to be true to the narrative rather than gamey to your advantage. But if you are gamey to your advantage, it's a solo game, so it doesn't matter. In Zero Dark, of course, it's more restrictive, um, and that is because Zero Dark is intended to be both a solo and versus game, and the Red Force appears in both, so it does need to dictate more clearly precisely what the enemy does. Um, although, it, in the solo game, by all means, be a little bit freer with your interpretation. Why not? Okay. Uh, da -da, we've talked about combat. Weapons and gear. Now, I will just touch upon weapons and gear. Uh, so there's a weapons table here. I had an email from somebody, a, email, a message on Facebook, from a, a Zero Dark player just the other day saying to me, um, had you considered putting weapon tables into Zero Dark? And my answer was, no, absolutely not. But I said, if somebody wanted to write a weapons table and submit it to me as part of my open submissions for the Zero Dark Compendium this year, that would be completely legit. I'd be really interested to see that. But this table, surprisingly, is a really good illustration of why there aren't weapon tables in Zero Dark. There doesn't need to be weapon tables in Five Parsecs from Home. Because if you look, these weapons have got one, two, three stats and a selection of limited traits. Stat is range, shots, damage, traits. I suspect you could take all of these weapons and boil them down to a simple set of rules to create your own weapons. And then you can decide on the range, shots, damage and traits on some kind of, I mean he's got credits in the game, on some kind of credits based system. Um, and then the players could make up their own weapons of any sort. But at the same time, I'm not criticising Ivan for having a weapons table for the same reason that I got that email the other day from somebody saying, have you considered weapons tables? Because people do respond well to this. It's an interesting psychological tool, uh, a weapons table. So this weapons table tells you a lot about how the author expects you to see this game. So when you've got a boarding sabre and a duelling pistol and a dazzle grenade and a hand laser and a rattle gun, you know, these names are telling me something about the setting the author expects this game to happen in. Yeah? I said pulp sci-fi. This is a pulp sci-fi game and these words confer and convey that pulp sci-fi setting. You know, when you pull out something like a ripper sword, who doesn't immediately think of a chainsaw? Who doesn't immediately think of their 40k minis or whatever they might be and go, yeah, I know what mini I can use for that. I know what part in my bits box I can use for that. Who doesn't instantly get that? Whereas my suggested approach, what I use in Zero Dark and what ages and ages ago I, I built for uh, Inquisitor, you know, a, a set of rules for making your own weapons is great but at the same time has the problem of one, analysis paralysis, when you're not sure what weapon to choose, but also conveying nothing about the feeling of the game itself. Now that's intentional for Zero Dark because it's a hard sci-fi setting, it is supposed to be broader, more accessible, less restrictive, but this approach makes perfect sense for five parsecs from home. So it's not a complaint, it's an observation. It's an interesting one. Okay. Uh, got a comment from Stefan again. Some example weapons in Zero Dark wouldn't be a terrible idea. It'd stop the dozens of how do you represent X weapon in Zero Dark questions. Uh, not a restrictive list, but this is a one example of how you might represent X. Yes. 
I completely agree. Um, community, make it happen. Uh, I'm not going to do it. Okay. Cool. Lots of stuff on weapon and gear, gun mods, utility devices, all kinds of stuff. Stuff for your ship as well. So onboard items that you don't have to model. They just appear on your ship, which is all cool. Uh, and then the details of how to build the starships themselves. And there's... Oops. Only a couple of pages on that. There we go. And then we're over into campaigns. Uh, now, I should say, I haven't given this book as deep a read as I would like to. Um, the, the post office tried to deliver it last week. Um, for whatever reason, I wasn't here. I got a card in my mailbox, and I didn't see that mailbox until earlier this week. So I only received this book yesterday, and I've only had time to read it this morning. Um, and the one area I didn't get as much time into as I wanted to was campaigns. But let me just talk about how I think I understand you're supposed to do campaigns in Five Parsecs from Home. And we've got Peter uh, on the live. I think Peter's still on the... My phone is thing has stopped. Uh, I think Peter Bickerton is still there. And I'm, as Peter has clearly played this game before, he'll tell me if I'm getting it wrong. Right. Okay. Campaigns in Five Parsecs are freeform. There is, in fact... Although it's very well hidden, it took me a while to find it. There is a sample campaign in the book. But you, you would blink and miss it. Okay. Um, in everything else there is, that is kind of a, a surprising omission. But as I say, there is one in here, but, but it's easy to miss. But the reason that it's easy to miss is because its approach to campaigns is, is unique. Um, and if the rules for the game itself are a little non-innovative, albeit clever, um, the approach to campaigns is unusual. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm holding back from innovative only because my mind is rapidly trying to remember if I'm going to be wrong. It's much, much closer to a role-play game than any kind of miniatures game campaign you will ever have played. So... There are two ways of playing it. One is basically you play from mission to mission. You set out with a goal. You know, that's what you come up with. You come up with a goal or a target or an aspiration for your team. And an obvious one is we want to earn so many thousand credits. Yep. And then you play missions in pursuit of your goal. And there are components in here for how to build a mission. And there are lots of different mission types, different enemies, different purposes, different reasons you might undertake that mission. All kinds of stuff. And you can sort of build each mission from scratch. Build the mission, play the mission, work out the end results in terms of your earnings and your damage and your recovery and your new gear and all kinds of stuff. And then make up the next mission. Okay? And keep playing missions consecutively until you get to your objective. Now, I need to look up that, that phrase that I couldn't remember before, which is, oh, I think it's story steps. So then what we've got are a variety of different step options. So we've got travel steps. So this is moving from place to place, from planet to planet. And you can move between missions to a new planet. And this are the rules for how to play on a new planet with all their different conditions. Uh, then you've got world steps. Um, and I, this is kind of to do with the intergame stuff. So this is uh, um, finding patrons, repairing the ship, helping the crew to recover, all that kind of stuff. Okay, gaining XP, repairing your kit, doing trading, for example. Trading's in the world steps. Okay, yeah. Job offers. It's a possible clue you see for your next campaign. You can seek a job offer when you get your job offer that inspires you to your next mission oh rumors checking for rivals all that kind of stuff and this section on battles explains how to do the battles uh, but there is a thing on story steps where's story steps post battle activities yep 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 loot yep where's story steps gone a story track there it is that's what it's called okay it's in appendix five the story track now, the rules here suggest that you probably don't want to play a story track campaign 
until you've played at least one freeform campaign to get a feel for the game. And I understand where he's coming from, but I think most people are going to be drawn to this to play more story tracks. I, I think if you're going to really get into five parsecs from home, it will be story tracks. And this is one of these areas where I think there is, there is a lot of room for Modiphius to monetize enthusiasm and interest in this game. Um, or possibly for other people to do so. So the idea with the story track is basically that you do make up a story. And each story has, a ba has you know, chapters and each chapter has a battle. Just like Operation Nemesis and Zero Dark. So, you know, it's a 12 chapter story. Each chapter has a mission. Each mission has an outcome and that dictates your success or otherwise in the story. Um, but the idea in this one, whereas in, in Operation Nemesis, the assumption is you're playing through the 12 missions and you may add the occasional side mission like a rescue mission or a mission from Most Wanted when that's published, for example, along the way, this kind of assumes that the story track is dotted throughout your longer campaign. So in this example story track, just given as a... where it says that it's on page 154, and it says sample story track, and this is the only sort of campaign that is offered in the book. Um, so it's got events, events one, two, three, four, five, and that's it. No, no, sorry, six, seven. There we go, yeah, that's it, six, seven. So there are seven steps in the seven events in the story track. Um, and you kind of decide when you're going to let each event happen in the course of your campaign. So you'd be playing other missions, and then you might go, oh, and now it's time for an event. Um, some things may trigger events. Some things may, so for example, the last one, um, da, 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 I'm sure there's a, yeah, so in the, in the um, story clock here, event seven says, you may delay this battle for up to three campaign turns. If you wait longer than that, basically, you've missed your opportunity to settle this event. The event has happened, you've missed it and you lose. Okay, so you've lost the story track. Now, as with a role-play game, losing can be as interesting as winning, okay, because this is a solo game. But it's interesting. There is a story clock, and I haven't had a chance to look into precisely how that works. So basically, you set the clock to various levels of tick, and I think you've got a number of ticks within which you're supposed to complete the story. It's a little bit like if you're running a role-play game and, um, you know, your, your heroes are rushing to bring news of the rampaging dragon to the king and along the way they discover an old woman who's been kidnapped by bears. You know, if you wait to rescue the old woman who's been kidnapped by bears, does that mean that by the time you get back to tell the king, it's too late and the dragon has overtaken you and got there and burnt the king? You follow me? So you've got to make decisions about where you're doing stuff. And I think that's where the clock sticks in. But as I said, I haven't had time to deeply read into this. Uh, the appendices, there's a lot of stuff in the appendices. Um, and, and the appendices should kind of be superfluous to the rest of the rules. But in this case, they're probably not. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the appendices, so red and black zone jobs, it's about different jobs, you know, more dangerous jobs, more risky jobs, bringing greater rewards, that kind of thing. Um, there's, I've missed a page somewhere. There's a little, there's a short appendix, appendix one is about the new edition, and what's different to the old edition. Uh, appendix two is about playing on a grid, so this is the grid conversion rule, so it's that half page there, and, uh, and that half page there. So less than a page of writing, and he's converted it to a grid. I, I, am, I am not worthy. Brilliant work. Uh, anything else in here I was going to... Oh yes, yes, I knew there was a thing I wanted to mention. So, Appendix 7, Game Mastering in 5 Parsecs from Home. So in the previous one he talked about the co-op play. Uh, and that's just a, a short piece. And I think anybody who's familiar with playing solo miniatures war games can understand that a solo game can be played co-op really quite easily with very little to, to distinguish, except you just have to decide how you're going to do stuff like spend your money. Okay. 
This, however, is interesting. Game mastering five parsecs. And again, I'm, you know, it, it's, it's quite a hefty piece, this appendix. Um, and I feel like this doesn't deserve to have been relegated to an appendix. I feel like this could have been included in the campaign section. That five parsecs is not a role play game, it's a miniatures game, but it really lends itself well to being played more like a role play game. So not, not to say to play it like a role play game, but more like a role play game than a miniatures game. With one or two or three or four cooperative players running the crew and a GM running the story track. Um, and can act as the patron, can act as, as the bad guys. So they still follow the rules for what the bad guys do, but it's not the individuals playing the game who get to decide how to follow those rules. It's the GM. Um, and I, I mean, I, it's always challenging. The idea of a miniatures game with a GM is always a challenge because you immediately go, well, we need at least three players now because we've got to have one on each side and a GM. Well, it doesn't apply here because it's a solo co-op game. You need two players, one to GM and one to play the game. And two players is the normal number. Um, and if you want to have more players than that, you know, you can play co-op. And it's very flexible and responsive. So uh, this is a very good game in which to have a GM'd miniatures game. Um, and, and I can see it really coming to life narratively when you, the players, don't know what the events are. And actually, you know, really thinking after one event, gosh, you know, we've got to be ready for the next event. We've got some clue as to what's going to happen, but we really, really need to make sure we've got this piece of equipment or our ship really needs to be fixed or we really need to make sure that we recruit this ally or have this patron on our side or make sure that they really like us or whatever it might be. We've got to go deep into the black zone. We better get ready. I can see it really coming to life uh, as a GM'd tabletop experience. So it seems that having it relegated to Appendix 7, yeah, it feel, feels like maybe maybe underplaying that part of the game that I think would be really interesting. Okay, anything else I wanted to pull out? Um, yeah, this was... Uh, okay. So, I and I don't wish to give, uh, I've forgotten his name now, uh, Christian Quino. I don't wish to, to give him any bad press, but, um, and his art's lovely, but it's sketchy. Uh, let's see if I can find some examples uh, that you're going to be able to see on camera. It's quite hard to tell. Um, I, I don't know how well you can see that sort of picture of a, of a building with a neon sign outside it. And I don't mean sketchy in the sense that, that they're like sketches. No, you know, these are finished pieces of art, but they're not they're not finished, finished. Um, and there are, there's really one major reason why you have this kind of sketchy style in a book like this, and this is cost. Um, this kind of sketchy finish on the art is much cheaper, it's much quicker for the artist to do. You know, these, these are a series of, of vector shapes put together, applied some special effects, did some fill cover, colour, a little bit of a sketch on top, and jobs are good. Um, and, you know, I'm not an artist, so obviously I could not do this, but I know how this is done, and, and I know it does not take very long. Um, and the art is, is evocative, but it's not, it does, it does kind of look cheap. Um, and it did strike me, particularly when we got to the end, an Appendix 9, and two pages of inspiration sketches in a book for a miniatures game, that contains no artwork, or sorry, photography, of actual miniatures. I, nah. <laughs> I don't know why that's there. I don't know why that, I, I, mm, no. Not a good idea. Um, got some sample thingies at the back, uh, which is, is cool, I suppose. I mean, these obviously can be, can be downloaded, I, I imagine. You can down. I, I didn't even look. I have got. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Have got digital versions of these, um, and, and it's good that they exist. I, I kind of wonder why you'd put them in the back of a book in this day and age, um, but I suppose the, the putting them in the back of the book tells you they exist, and then you'd go and look for digital versions that you can fill out yourself. 
Um, but yeah, th these look a lot like a, an RPG character sheet. Um, and so your team is kind of like a character. You know, that's that's best way to think of it in this game, that your team is like, in terms of its complexity and its dynamic, it's like your team is a character in a role-play game. And then some adverts, and then some references. Weapon references, completely unnecessary addition. Uh, campaign turn, completely unnecessary. Campaign turn. It, you, you sat down after a game, you don't need a reference for a campaign turn. You have the 30 seconds it takes to find this page in the book. You have nothing but time. Um, battle round prep reference, absolutely fine. Good, good idea. Okay, so, you know, not, not a perfect idea, but some, some strange stuff. Okay, uh, there was a thing I wanted to talk about, uh, having got to the end. Yes, yes, I remember what it was. Okay, uh, I've got some, it's, uh, oh gosh, it's only four minutes to three. I've not had, I did have some other stuff to cover, so I won't, won't talk about uh, what we were going to talk about. I'm just going to do a quick recap on how we finished last week's episode. Now, last week I did an unboxing of Star Wars Legion Death Troopers, um, and I've really enjoyed building and converting them this week, and I've started painting them. Um, so I'm going to need to turn a light on so you guys can see what's going on here. So hold on a tick. Let's get that light on. Let's get that around and move that camera down here. Oops, a daisy. Okay, let's get down here because uh, these are so these are the, my sort of half painted Star Wars Legion Death Troopers. As you can see, I have not painted them black. Uh, that is completely intentional. Star Wars purists, tough. Um, so there we go. We've got our uh, Star Wars Legion Death Troopers. That's what they look like. And now let, let's have a look at a um, regular 28mm miniature uh, next to these guys. These guys is big. I mean, they're really big. I mean, I don't know if you can even see just how much uh, bigger they are. Let's uh, give you a better look there. See, I thought these were maybe like 32, 35 mil. These are more like 40 mil minis. In fact, I've got, that's funny, I'll just get the Infinity Mini. That's a, a recent Infinity Mini, just to give you a contrast. Even a uh, Space Marine, Primaris Space Marine, is short. In fact, I've got a 40 mil Mini in my miniatures cabinet here somewhere. There he is. So let's, let's compare them to an actual 40 mil Mini. Let's move these guys here. Here we go. Actual 40 mil Templar, slightly shorter than the Death Troopers. That's astonishing. You know, I mean, I knew Star Wars Legion increased the scale compared to their old uh, Imperial Assault minis. And I have some, I've got some Imperial Assault here as well somewhere. If you're interested in how they contrast, where have I put my Imperial Assault guys? Uh... I can't put my hands on them straight away, and I'm, I'm mystified by that. I, I could have sworn I had them handy. But I can't see them now. Oh, there they are. Perfect. Got a Stormtrooper. Got an Imperial Salt Stormtrooper. And, and brace yourself. Aren't you a little bit short to be a Stormtrooper? Yes. I, okay, it was an obvious comment. But uh, I, am, I am stunned by how tall these Death Troopers are. I thought 32 mil maybe, 35 mil at the most, but these are comfortably, comfortably 40 mil minis. So uh, yeah, I continue to be quite disappointed with Star Wars Legion. Okay, it is three o'clock and, and that is everything I had to say. Uh, quick shout out, has anybody got any questions? Just turn that light off again. If anybody's got any questions, now is your chance. I don't know why I've suddenly gone all smeary and uh, and blurred on there. Have I just uh, have I just smeared my lens somehow? No, nope, it's not the lens. Uh, it is the software. So sorry about that. Uh, 
Okay, last comments from Mark. What have we got? We've got Stefan. Stefan says, I believe Blades in the Dark uses that kind of abstract clock system. Maybe it does. I don't know. Blades in the Dark. Uh, Mark Bjorkman, now I want a zero dark mission to rescue an old woman kidnapped by bears. Uh, we do have the rescue mission already. Uh, I'd have to make up rules for bears in the Red Force. Um, I'm sure you can help me out with that, Mark. There's a, there's a whole open submission thing. And Stefan, the lack of mini picks is odd. Not like Modiphius, don't make a bunch of mini ranges they could have used. Yeah, but as you say, IP issues, I don't think it would have gone down well to use the Fallout IP. Definitely not uh, Elder Scrolls. Um, Arctan Cthulhu, they maybe could have, but again, it doesn't really fit. It's pulp sci-fi, not, uh, not diesel punk. Uh... Don't have a five parsecs mini lined plan. No, I, I'm pretty sure they don't have a five parsecs mini line planned, uh, which is one of the reasons why it upsets me that, that that opportunity to promote some really good independent UK miniatures manufacturers or even US EU miniatures manufacturers wasn't taken, uh, which is a shame. Now, overall, final thoughts. It's a good book. It's a good game. Um, I said Polyversal isn't going to hit the table for a long time because it requires so much thought. I want to get this onto the table as soon as possible. I've got some minis that are going to be great for this. Um, I want to play this game. So, yeah, that, that's probably a good summary. I want to play this game. Okay, that's all. Um, I'll see you all again next week. <laughs> <laughs>